uh, most specifically for genomics. And um, we're going to start with an introduction to deep learning, and I'm going to try to relate it back to what you guys learned in class. Um, you guys kind of saw a little bit of machine learning from SDM, so we'll see how it kind of starts to relate to that. Um, it's going to be really math heavy at the beginning. This is the first time that I've shown it this way. This is how I like it because I know what's going on. Later on, when we switch to the applications, we'll see more about like the diagrams that you see when you read papers, which I think are really silly diagrams, but whatever. Um, and then we'll kind of see some extensions at the end, and depending on time, I can pop up some code or whatever and take questions. Um, I do want to mention this will most likely be on final, um, you know, big ideas, so take notes, ask questions. All right, so jumping right into the math. Sorry if it's really ugly for you guys. Uh, we're going to be starting and considering observations x. We're going to really start this from like a statistics standpoint or a computer science standpoint. So x are, are going to be our ID observations. If you want to think about it as sequences, um, in your head, that's where we'll be going with this. So X could be a big, each XI is one nucleotide sequence. Let's say 100 base pairs in length. And then we have some YI, some vector Y of outcomes. For now, we'll just consider it as binary. It's very simple, 0, 1, equivalently negative 1, 1. So you have labels associated with each sequence or each X. A very, very simple, the simplest model would be ordinary least squares. And that's where we just set up x here would be a matrix now, x times omega. In statistics, you write omega as a beta vector, p by 1 beta vector, right? And then in order to fit these omega weights, which are just a linear combination of your predictors, you would fit it by minimizing some risk function. So in this example, I'm saying minimize the empirical risk. So minimize the loss over your training data set, which is what you guys did in the homework uh, with the SBMs. Here, we're just saying now squared loss. Squared loss is really nice. It's the easiest one. We'll see later why that is. But alternatively, in module two, you guys saw SBMs. Now, an SBM is like a different thing, right? It's not fitting in a line per se, it's fitting a hyperplane through your data points. But that doesn't really matter, that's no different than just reformulating the risk that you're minimizing. The risk is called hinge loss, and it takes this form, max of one minus your true label, so that would be a one or a negative one, times your predicted label which would be x omega. x omega is not bounded. It could be negative 50, it could be positive 50. But when you take the max of one minus this, if your prediction is correct, this is gonna be zero. This is gonna be one minus one. That means that the prediction had the same sign, sorry, the prediction had the same sign as the true label. Right? So if it doesn't have the right sign, your loss arising from that point would be the max of 0 or 1, which is 1. And you just minimize this loss function to find the omegas. Right? That's exactly what you guys did in the SVM example. You can think about putting on different kernels. I'm not going to go into that at all. But you can see that this risk function, which you're minimizing, can be put up right into this same equation, right? You're minimizing and trying to find the weights, and you do that through some procedure. Now, let's take that and go one step further to logistic regression. How many of you are familiar with logistic regression? Cool, good, that's good. When we set up our simple linear model on the previous slide, and put it under squared loss, right? A very, very simple model. There's gonna be no constraints on our prediction. Y hat, we call that, you know, what x beta, x omega equals, could be negative 10 or positive 10. 
but we're really interested in y being between 0 and 1, right? Binary. So if y is between 0 and 1, we want to constrain our x omega between 0 and 1. Who knows how you do that in logistic regression? The sigma function? Exactly. Just like I have right here, you take a transformation of your linear part. Okay? Now this is going to be a key aspect. We have a linear part, right? That's just a matrix multiplication. Then we have a nonlinear transformation. From now on, I'm going to be referring to this nonlinear transformation as G sub omega. In logistic regression, you have your linear part, and then you do one nonlinear transformation. That's going to constrain all of your predictions, your y hats, to being between 0 and 1. And then it can actually be interpreted as a probability, right? A probability of a positive outcome given your covariates and your weight vector. Okay? What is this g function under squared loss? If it helps, I'll pop it back up over here. Recall this was squared loss. What would g need to be such that I could put a g right here and get the same thing? It's just the identity function. Under squared loss, when we say x omega, right, right here, if g of g sub omega of x is just the identity function, it's not changing our linear prediction, right? And on the previous slide, slide I said, let's start with a linear prediction, as simple as we can. So we add that nonlinearity. Under squared loss, there's no nonlinearity. It's still a linear model. When you think of any other g's, any other nonlinear functions, who's heard of Poisson regression? That would just be tacking on the log. G would actually be the exponentiation. Um, who's heard of a ray loop? A ReLU is a nonlinearity imposed upon our linear function. Same thing with the tan H function. We'll see these a little bit later. That's how they're going to be coming into uh, neural networks. So we really, it's very basic. We haven't done anything deep yet. But this is where we're going to see what deep learning is, right? So we started with this modeling our binary outcome y, our model the probability of a positive outcome, given our covariates and our weights. And we said that this is some nonlinear function of some linear weights multiplied by our design matrix. Now the vector omega, or in statistics it would be a beta vector, is p by 1, where p is our number of covariates. This is simple. This is simple OLS up to this point. But when we use that p by 1 matrix, right, through matrix multiplication, you end up with an m by 1 matrix. But there's no reason this needs to just have a single column. What if we make this a 2, or 3, or 5, or a 1 million? Then you're going to have an output matrix from this step that's n rows by 1 million columns. It doesn't correspond to the probability of y equaling 1 anymore. Now it just corresponds to some feature map, which is the term used in computer science to talk about once you've applied some sort of transformation to the input feature space, you have now have an n by whatever matrix of features or feature map. So, like I'm saying here, what if omega is a matrix instead of a vector? Then the matrix multiplication gives us a matrix from which we can just repeat the same process. So if x times omega, and omega is a p by k matrix, gives us an n by k matrix, we can just iterate the process and stick on another linear set of weights 
onto that matrix, stick out another nonlinearity, and just keep repeating this. This idea of function composition is what deep learning is. Is this deep? Sure, why not? It has two layers. Each of these is one layer in your own network. Each of these weight matrices are linear operators working on the feature map from the previous layer or the previous function before nonlinearity gets tacked up. And you repeat this. Maybe 10 times until you have a 10 layer neural network. And then you try to figure out how you're going to fit those weights. Are there any questions on this? Really just taken logistic regression and done it again. Now, if you really start looking into programming these things up yourself, these are not, these are not going to be necessarily matrices. They're going to be tensors. Who's heard of the term tensor before? So a, a tensor is a a matrix is a two-dimensional vector, right? A tensor is three-dimensional or four-dimensional. It's, it's the generalization. I should have said a matrix is a two-dimensional tensor. A vector is a one-dimensional tensor. Anything with more than two dimensions, we don't call it a matrix, we call this a tensor. So generally, this will be four-dimensional. And then thinking about a matrix multiplication, to get this, is a little bit challenging. And that's, that's why I show the map. Because if you need to program this, you need to know what's going on. And this is all that's going on behind the scenes. Cool. So we, we saw what the model is. We'll see the pretty pictures later. Great. Relating back to slide one, we have this risk function. For example, square ones, or logistic ones, or log ones. And then we're minimizing to try to find the weights. Now, if I'm looking at simple ordinary least squares, a very, very, very powerful tool, we can fit the weights with a closed form solution. Those of you who have taken stats, stats 101, this will be like the first thing you're doing when you see regression. They'll say, like, find the beta coefficient. And you take the do so, or you take the derivative of this function and set it equal to zero and solve for the omegas. And it gives us this nice, beautiful, one of the most important formulas in all of statistics x transpose x inverse, x transpose y. Awesome, super powerful tool. Provided the inverse exists, we can always get that like that. However, the second we stick on our g, Second, we stick this guy on, on top of our linear part, make it nonlinear, all hell breaks loose. It's hard, you can't just fit it, you can't just get a closed form solution. This is where iterative methods such as Newton Raphson come into play. Now, to fit logistic regression, you would take the derivatives right and do some sort of EM algorithm or Newton Raphson on the log likelihood. Now, statisticians in the room, I'm going to, I'm being very explicit saying in GLMs, so in logistic regression or Poisson regression, the risk function corresponds one to one to a statistical distribution. What's the number one assumption you make when you use ordinary least squares? Normality of the residual. If you take the log likelihood of a Gaussian likelihood, so a normal distribution, right, you have one of the square root of 2 pi, sigma, times some big e to the negative one half, x omega minus y 
squared. This is the Gaussian likelihood. If we take the negative log likelihood, the negative log of this, all that goes away. The negative log of one, this one half is just a is just a scaling factor. So that goes away and the negative goes away. We have x of omega minus y, which is exactly what I wrote up there. So under OLS, we're assuming normality of the residuals, right? We're assuming a Gaussian likelihood for a model. Under logistic regression, we did this for our transformation, which we could show corresponds one to one with binary or binomial likelihood. So any TLM has a corresponding log likelihood through the, the loss function. Okay? So you can maximize the negative log likelihood to train your model. But the second we're in, in this world, right? So going from going from just the linear world to the nonlinear world was a heading. We now have to invent tons more techniques, new graphs, iterative techniques to fit the W. That's fine. Now when we go from this world to this world, it becomes even harder. And so there are different techniques for fitting models in deep learning to account for this. And that's where you hear about the famous backpropagation algorithm. Really no different than taking derivatives and using the chain rule to, from the back of your model, go forward and calculate how much you should update each parameter. Very, very similar to the logistic regression example. Instead of having p weights, you now have like a million weights because we have all of those function compositions. And each one has a tensor of omegas that we need to fit. All right, so these nonlinear, the deep functions, the compositions of functions, are very complicated to fit. They're not just smooth, concave functions, right? You can't just start here and roll your ball down and be guaranteed to sit on a global optimum. You can do that under logistic regression, under Poisson regression, under those techniques. You're guaranteed of optimality. Under these complicated ones with all those layers, your, your space is very complicated. So if you roll the ball, you might just be in a, a, a local minimum, but not the global minimum. Right? So you need different techniques to fit. That's exactly what they do. That's exactly what backpropagation is. So if you hear the term backpropagation, you can't say I didn't tell you what it was, but it's really just the chain rule to fit the weights, right? To fit all of those millions of omegas. And in addition to just like the backpropagation aspect, there are a lot of heuristics that uh, People have been applying to deep learning that really, really, really work well and help. Before I started in computer science, I never really heard the term heuristics applied in this manner. So I just thought I would kind of put it out there right away. It's really, it's doing things that we don't have any theory on why it's working, but it works. And there is a lot of theory in computer science, and deep learning is kind of getting there, but a lot of things are done because they work. And then the theory gets developed after. So that's what we're going to see it later when I throw out all these terms that things just kind of work and you don't really understand why. Okay. We're done with the math. Now we're going to be looking at the pretty picture. But now you know what this pretty picture is, right? So if you started in the most inner, compositionality of that function. So the most nested will be starting over here. And then each layer, this would be one layer, is one function composition. This is one of the g sub omegas. And then this is g sub omega 2. And then g sub omega 3, g sub omega 4, g sub omega 5. And then this is probability of y equals 1 given x and omega. It's the same exact thing. I just expanded out all of those compositions. In addition, I put on some fancy terms that we'll go over in one second. Um, but I really want to hammer home this idea that we are doing the exact same thing. Here are our omega weights. 
Each, each one of these would be a matrix of omegas that we need to train. Same thing here. Same thing here, same thing here, same thing here. All of those contains all contain the millions of weights that we need to train via gradient descent to back propagation. Gradient descent just referring to those methods uh, uh, such as Newton Raphson for optimization. Okay. So we, we kind of get most of this picture, but one of these heuristics that started working really, really well for deep learning was the use of convolutional filters. So that's what I'm depicting over here. Now, in the previous slides, I was saying, and, and true here, each time we do that linear part, the x times omega, we have a vector or a matrix of tons of omegas, right? And each omega is corresponding to one aspect of the matrix. So let me just write that up really quick. A very simple case, right? So you have n observations as your row dimension, and you would have p features. And fitting a matrix of omega, or a, yeah, let's do a matrix. You would have k columns in your weight matrix, and p rows. And logistic regression, this is a one. Now, this entire outer product matrix multiplication is going to involve k by p omega. Each one of those needs to be fit. That's what's being done here. An outer matrix multiplication. A full, you're going to get an, an n by k matrix. What are the convolutional filters? Well, that's saying, hold up. We don't, we don't want to necessarily fit a different feature for each of the p columns. There could be some redundancy. There could be spatial features. So in images, these are like curves, right? You don't care necessarily that there's a curve right there. You care that a curve is anywhere. So instead of having this p by k matrix, a convolutional filter shrinks it down, we will say F, okay, F is, F is less than P, it's very small, and we're going to take this filter and pop it on and slide it. Essentially, we're taking the old paradigm and shrinking down our design matrix into tons and tons and tons of separate matrices that will then multiply with this guy. So you're, you're, cons you're bringing down the space of the weights, right? Instead of having a huge matrix, now you have a smaller matrix that slides, slides all over the place. That's what I'm depicting here and here. And those are what are termed convolutional filters. So when you hear the term convolutional neural net, that means that you have this aspect, which is your neural network, which we saw as all outer product multiplications. And then you have your convolutional part, which is just inner product multiplications to reduce the parameters. Any questions on the convolutional filter? Or, and convolutional neural nets. They are going to be the biggest idea that we see today. Um, they're the most popular, pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So I understand that convolution that was probably really helpful for images um, to normalize the learning that we're thinking about where exactly the picture you're looking for is versus where you are. But how does it play into the neural nets for the genes that you're looking for? Exactly, exactly. So I'm going to hold off on answering that for two more slides. Um, and then we will we will see, and it will hopefully help. Yeah. 